Hello, I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Now, in today's episode, we're concerned about paradoxes and hypodoxes. This very sentence I'm uttering now is false. Is it true? If it is, then what it says holds. Since what it says is that it is false, it follows that it is true. If it is true, it is false. But if it is false, then what it says does not hold. Since it says that it is false, it follows that if it is true, then it is false. So the sentence that I've uttered is true, just in case it's false. False, just in case it's true. Now, this is a classic liar paradox, a semantic paradox in philosophy that involves the notions of truth and falsity and the inconsistency that they may bring. One way to defuse this paradox and avoid logical explosion, says our guest, is to convert it to a hypodox, which makes a conundrum consistent, but its truth is still underdetermined. Now, to discuss paradoxes and hypodoxes and why they matter, we have Peter Eldridge Schmidt, a visiting fellow at the Australian National University, and along with his daughter Veronique, the co inventor of the Pinocchio paradox. So, hello, Peter. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. Thank, thank you, JJ. It's a pleasure to be here. I welcome the opportunity to speak with you about these things. Okay, so before getting into our main topic, let's first discuss your philosophical background. How did you get started in philosophy? Um, I, I, I started off doing a double major in, um, in psychology and philosophy. Um, and then I had a couple of severe bouts of glandular fever and I only just finished my major in philosophy and then went out to the workforce. Um, but I was always passionate uh, about developing an approach to paradoxes, particularly the liar paradox. So every now and again, I would keep coming back and doing more philosophy part-time, mostly part-time. Mm -hmm. Um, so it became a bit of a, an on again, off again line. I mainly worked for private companies. I did some work in government. Um, being from a philosophical background did have some advantages. I, I, um, some of the executives would recognize that, that I could take on original projects. Um, so I developed a Qantas in user systems development guide for Qantas. Um, had me as the author and 14, a steering committee of 14 people, to, each of which had to sign off on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, that was no mean feat. Um, I had a bit of a midlife career crisis and I came back and started a part-time PhD in 2000, which I completed in 2008. Mm -hmm. um, and I did get, um, uh, I had a a fair amount of work. I, early on, I had some tutoring at Sydney and Wollongong, and then later on, some lecturing at ANU and CSU and a private institute in in uh, Sydney. Mm -hmm. So, what what was it like to be in a, a Qantas, you know, the the airline company, and you are a philosopher trained in philosophy? So, what is it like to be in that business commercial atmosphere? Overall, it was good. Um, at times, people didn't know how to take me. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, at times uh, I was known to ask too many questions. No. <laughs> um, as philosophers, but as I say, as I say, <laughs> you know, at other times they they saw the opportunity. Uh, they saw me as someone they could give um, a. a an, you know, an original piece of work to such as that end user systems development guide. Mm -hmm. I, I got to talk to engineers and business people about what they were doing, which was very interesting um, in the development, in developing that guide, because I wanted mm -hmm. to have an understanding of who I was writing it for and what they were actually doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it, it worked both ways. Um, I think it was an experience from which I overall I benefited. Okay, so, but who will influence you to pursue a career in academic philosophy? Oh, well, uh, my idols, I guess, uh, Buridan, Pryor, Arthur Pryor, David mm. Lewis, um, you know, for me, you know, the, 
the goal is to write something like chapter eight of Bourdain's Suffolk Martyr on, you know, insolubles. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, in real time, I, I, I was influenced by Michael McDermott and Peter Roper. Uh, mm. Michael McDermott was always uh, encouraging me and saying, you know, what was my strategy, which I think was something I needed. <laughs> the culmination, uh, probably the pinnacle of my philosophy career was uh, an article in Mind in January 2015 um, I, I've had particular projects, um, you know, the taxonomy of paradoxes and hypodoxes, um, uh, as well as writing about particular paradoxes, my daughter's Pinocchio paradox in particular, um, and pursuing, you know, uh, uh, my own approach to the liar paradox. Okay, so let's go there. Let's go to our main topic. What's, what are paradoxes? Yes, so in itself, um, people describe various things as paradoxes. So if you try and think about a particular thing, type of thing that paradoxes are, you, you find that people will talk about opinions against common sense, particularly those that have an argument for them. And in line with that, Quine would talk about um, conclusions that were sustained by an absurd conclusions that were sustained by an argument. Um, you get a very similar definition from Sainsbury, um, and he, but he wants it to be a good argument. So a seemingly sound argument to an absurd conclusion would be a paradox. Um, and there's some debate there as to whether it needs to be, you know, uh, the premises need to be factual or whether they can be merely possible. Uh -huh. um, there are, but you also find that people will describe Escher images. So if you're familiar with Escher staircases where, where people appear to be able to walk continuously upward and yet ended up, end up where they started from, um, some philosophers will describe them as paradoxical. Um, other definitions from philosophers like Nicholas Rescher are that uh, a paradox is a collection of statements, each of which is plausible on its own. Um, but they can't be collectively true, um, so they're collectively inconsistent. Um, Sorensen uh, has a very accessible book on the history of paradox uh, back from around 2001 or three, uh, 2003, I think. Um, and he says that paradoxes are a species of riddle with more than one good answer. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think he means more than one good incompatible answer. <laughs> and and so you can see if all of these things are paradoxes, that philosophers actually have too many good answers to what a paradox is. And there's some work to do here, I think, on the concept of paradox, which is part of my project uh, for a taxonomy. Um, you know, if you want to see Frank Jackson about generally about what conceptual analysis is, but, you know, I think it's in, it behoves philosophers to analyze the concept mm. of paradox and try to achieve some sort of reduction um, that accounts for all this divergent, the divergence of, uh, you know, cases. And uh, so I'm working towards that uh, in my own work. There, there are a number of heuristics that are very useful. Um, Sainsbury, who, who you know, saying basically his definition is that a paradox is a seemingly sound argument to an absurd conclusion or an unacceptable conclusion, he says. So he then goes on to say that, well, that means you can, you've got three options. You can accept the conclusion after all, you mm. can reject one of the premises, or you, you can find four with one of the inferences. In other words, one of these mm. set of options. It, it, it sounds pretty close, but you know, then you, then you find people like um, Pablo Cabreras and Dave Ripley, um, who will deny transitivity of inferences. So a paradox might, in its argument, might have a number of steps. Mm each of which represents an individual inference. Dave Ripley might say that each of those inferences on their own is okay, but, you know, going from the first inference to perhaps the second or third, mm. the, trans the sequence of those inferences is not acceptable. 
So what it, 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 transitivity of entailment or transitivity of those inferences fails. He says, uh -huh. this is not something in, in uh, Sain covered by Sainsbury's heuristics. So, you know, philosophers have this habit of jumping out of the square. <laughs> just, you know, it's just, which, hence I refer to, to that sort of trilemma of, of uh, Sainsbury as a heuristic rather than being um, a complete and exhaustive classification of the sort of ways, of the, ways you can handle paradoxes. Uh, in, uh, the, in William James's lecture on pragmatism, his second lecture, he starts it off with an example of resolving a contradiction by making a distinction. And it's not clear, which is something you can do for paradoxes. Uh, and it's not clear how that relates to Sainsbury's trilemma, whether it's covered or slightly, it's in some cases outside of it. Wow. Now, another useful heuristic is uh, Quine's trichotomy. You know, the way he classified paradoxes was to classify them as veridical, falsidical, and antinomous. Mm -hmm. um, now, if 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 Julius Caesar had been Quine, you would have said all paradoxes are divided into three classes, the veridical, the falsidical, and the antinomous. Caesar wasn't Quine and Quine, and Quine, and Quine didn't do that. He didn't say that, that his classification was exhaustive. Um, and there's good reason to think that, that it isn't. But, um, but it's pretty good. As far you know, so if you look at it as a heuristic, it's very useful. Um, so if you remember Quine's definition of paradoxes was that they're conclusions that are supported by an argument, mm -hmm. absurd conclusions rather that are supported uh, that are supported by an argument. So for um, for Quine, a, a veridical paradox is, is their cases where. In fact, the absurd conclusion is true. Um, and he gives examples like um, the, the birthday paradox, Gilbert's birthday paradox out of Gilbert and Sullivan's Pirates of Panzance. It's an operator uh, from the 1800s, late 1800s, uh, in, in which one of the lead character is a, a chap called Frederick, who's in a, in a comic scenario indentured to a pirate king as it were, as a, an apprentice or something. I don't know quite why, <laughs> but he's indentured to a pirate king until his 21st birthday. Mm -hmm. uh, and the catch is he was born on the 29th of February. <laughs> so there's this lovely little song about a paradox, a paradox, a most ingenious paradox, where, where Frederick is, is debating, you know, sort of when he actually turns 21 or more to the point when his 21st birthday is. Mm -hmm. Um, because although he's about to turn 21 in terms of his age, it's the pirate king is very, very much of the opinion that he's not 21 until he's past 21 birth, as his 21st birthday, which Quine would argue comes but once every four years. <laughs> um, because February 29 is a leap year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So Quine, Quine's argument for response to that is to say, well, that's true. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, in terms of his age, he's going to turn 21. But in terms of his 21st birthday, which he's indentured to, his birthday has to be, Quine says, has to be on the exact date. Mm -hmm. um, and so it'll be many years hence. Mm. Um, yeah. The Barber paradox is another example. Um, there's a barber who's a villager who shaves all and only those villagers who do not shave themselves. And then philosophers like to ask who shaves the barber. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you can to and throw with this after a while, but ultimately it turns out that there can't be such a barber. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the reason this is a vertical paradox, I think, is because there's nothing to back up the existence of such a barber. There's no principle you can appeal to that says there should be such a barber. It's actually, if, in, if you look at the formal logic of it, it actually instantiates mm. a contradiction. 
um, in, the, in the sense of being the negation of a theorem in, all, in logic. But um, basically, so basically it's self-contradictory. Um, the Frederick paradox, Quine says, the Frederick paradox is a vertical one. If we take its proposition not about something about Frederick, this is the birthday paradox, but as an abstract truth that a man can be four in four times the number of years he's passed old on his nth birthday. Mm. Similarly, the barber, says Quine, uh, paradox is a vertical one if we take its proposition about as being that no village contains such a barber. So in order for it to be vertical, you've actually got to use the argument, Quine says, as a reductio. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, you assume rather than have premises saying there is such a barber, you you assume that there's such a barber because nothing guaranteed you there was such a barber. And then you reduce it to, you, you derive a contradiction. And because you've derived a contradiction in certain logics, that most logics, that, that will result in negating your assumption mm. or one of your assumptions. And in this case, there's no such barber. There's, um, there's an interesting example in Chinese. Um, the, the word for paradox or self-contradiction is an idiom, um, which, which actually gives an example, um, which in some ways is better than the barber. Um, and, and, you know, sort of, a, a, I'll move on at this point, but I just want to mention that this is not a particularly Western philosophy. Yes, I, I think it's worth mentioning. You know, these these <laughs> concepts <laughs> are not just Western, not necessarily just Western concepts. Right. Um, and and you know, the ancient Chinese had this idiom for it that that works very very well with the idea of a vertical. What Quine just said about a vertical paradox. Um, now, moving on, Quine's idea of a falsitical paradox is, as you might expect, uh, one that commits a fallacy. So he gives the example of, there are proofs that Bull gave of, uh, uh, fallacious proofs of zero equal to being equal to one, where, where, where there's a thinly disguised use of division by zero. Mm -hmm. You mightn't spot it right away, but it's there. <laughs> um, and, and so the, these, these are proofs in which uh, a fallacy has been committed and, and Quine regards them as political. They lead to a, a false conclusion. Why do we have anything else? We've got the antinomies left over. How could there be anything more than, than just true conclusions and false conclusions? And here's where, you know, you have to do a little bit of interpretation of what Quine's saying. He says for an antony, antinomy, that an antinomy produces a self-contradiction by accepted ways of reasoning. Mm -hmm. It establishes that some tacit and trusted pattern of reasoning must be made explicit and henceforward be avoided or revised. So he has in mind um, his, uh, you know, paradigm cases are cases like Belial. There's also Russell's paradox, mm -hmm. uh, Berry's paradox. So uh, in the case of the liar, which we'll come back to, he, he would suggest that our, we use uh, reasoning that follow, trusted patterns of reasoning uh, based on the, our concept of truth that have to be avoided and revised, mm -hmm. which for some of us is pretty drastic. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but you know, this this is actually an orthodox approach. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I, I would say a large percentage of philosophers and um, mathematicians who think, who's, if they think about these things at all, would would follow Quine in this mm -hmm. uh, response to the liar paradox. Um, so, and we'll come back to that. Russell's paradox. Well, it has to do with membership uh, of class. So. Some classes or sets, if you prefer, are members of themselves, some are not. Mm -hmm. uh, so the class of all classes that have more five than five members clearly has more than five members and is a self-member of itself. But the class of all men is not a man, so it, it's not a member of itself. Um, the class of all classes that are not members of themselves, Quine says, uh, since its members are not members, self-members, it qualifies as a member of itself, if and only if it doesn't. Um, and the, the thing that's going on here, Quine points out, is 
for any condition you can formulate, such as not being a member of itself or being a person or being, you know, a horse or so on, uh, this principle seems to naturally form a set of objects that would meet that condition. Uh, and it's not, a, and he says, this principle is not easily given up. Uh, the almost invariable way of specifying a class is by stating a necessary and sufficient condition for belonging to it. Mm. And I think that's right. It's not easily given up. Um, but his attitude is, yep, it's got to go. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, sort of, or it's or it's got to be uh, revised. Right? So, so you know, most um, uh, solutions to Russell's paradox follow that pattern. They're either revising that uh, principle, or restricting it in some way, if you like, um, or they're replacing it with other principles. Uh, and by principle, I mean what Quine is saying here about an, ex, you know. A usually accepted or trusted pattern of reasoning. Okay, so um, so so far we have Sainsbury's uh, trilemma. Mm -hmm. So a paradox uh, results from some kind of reasoning from innocent premises leading to an absurd conclusion. So either accept the conclusion, absurd conclusion, reject one of the premises, or reject one of, of one of the steps leading to the conclusion. You also discuss Quine's trichotomy of vertical paradoxes like the birthday paradox. Okay, and that's a fun, funny <laughs> uh, paradox, the barber paradox. You have also falsidical. You have false conclusions right away, basing from poor reasoning. And you have this kind of paradox, the antinomies, the liar paradox, mm -hmm. and of course, Russell's paradox. Now, let's go to the liar paradox, which is the main target of our discussion. Yeah, just a little bit um, more of an introduction, if I may. Okay, uh, no worries. Um, I think, and we'll get there directly. I, I, I want to take a step back from what Quine says about antinomies, because I think he focuses on a narrow set of paradoxes mm -hmm. in what he says about antinomies. Um, the, the term comes to us from Kant, uh, who adopted it from legal terminology, mm -hmm. um, about inconsistencies arising in law or laws. Um, and, and so I guess what we do is we, gen and what Kant did was to generalize laws uh, to be, you know, what we might call philosophically and in, in the way Russell used to, in terms of the principles. Um, and, and so, you know, you get paradoxes like, or antinomies like the ship of Theseus. Hmm. Um, so there's an ancient story about the ship of Theseus having been maintained by the Athenians. And uh, someone actually wrote up that, you know, sort of, well, they maintained the ship replacing it plank by plank. Um, and, and then this person said, so what happens if they get gather all the original parts and they put them back together, mm -hmm. which one is the ship of Theseus? So you have this, these two prince competing principles. You have um, the continuity of something over time that's a well-maintained ship and uh, something that's made up of all the original parts arranged in the original structure. Um, and the paradoxical question is which one is the ship of Theseus? Um, and it seems that you know, these, these two principles, which normally would uh, not conflict, conflict in this scenario. Uh, now, the, just flagging ahead something we will come to, I would say that the, the concept of antinomy in this, this sort of sense has a, is um, inconsistently overdetermined. No. When, when we, these by accepted principles. So these principles about the ship, which is the ship of Theseus, overdetermine, which is inconsistently overdetermine, which is the ship of Theseus, whether it's the one that's well maintained or whether it's the one from reassembled from original components. And I've come up with a concept that I call hyperdox, and it's similar to, to some other concepts that are around, but uh, the concept I have in mind when I talk about a high hypodox is the dual, so to speak, of that 
conception of antinomy. Uh, hyperdox is underdetermined for mm. lack of an accepted principle that would determine the matter. And so uh, perhaps we, we should just quickly do some examples in our introduction and then we'll move on to the liar. Um, so um, you, you probably, many people are probably familiar anecdotally with the, the grandfather paradox. It's a paradox about time travel. Kim, you know, for some misguided reason wants to go back and assassinate his grandfather. Um, he, Tim's a time traveling assassin. He's got a perfect hit record. Um, you know, you can build it all up as, as much as you want. Um, uh, but if there's just one timeline um, and grandfather and grandmother are not, uh, not time travelers, then uh, Tim, it can't go back and kill grandfather succeed in killing grandfather or it seems he can't because then you would have the inconsistent events the event of grandfather dying back in 1923 um versus grandfather being alive up until in being alive in 1944 it's it's um so Lewis, david lewis's solution to this is a laissez-faire laissez-faire <laughs> theory of time travel you just can't do it <laughs> contradictions <laughs> won't happen, even if time travel is possible right and he does contracts to this with with other scenarios that you know so you could call them science fantasy i think those sort of scenarios but he does contrast this with science fiction where people have thought more carefully authors have thought more carefully about it so can uh, we've got my own sort of cut down example uh, is the grandmother hyperdox mm -hmm. So Tess has always wondered who saved her five-year-old grand from being run over by a tram. Mm -hmm. She time travels back to witness the event and it becomes clear to her that she's the only person in a position in time to save grand. She does so. And so part of her existence becomes, forms a, a, a causal loop yeah. in time um and, and this 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 i say is a hyperdox lewis would say they're possible yeah these sort of scenarios um so you you begin to see that you can have paradoxes and hyperdoxes in pairs so just as the concept was of hyperdoxes is dual to a certain restricted conception of paradox for many paradoxes that fit that restricted description you can have a paired hyperdox. Mm -hmm. um, so let's revisit just quickly the um, birthday, Gilbert's birthday paradox. Right, so Quine says age is reckoned in elapsed time, whereas a birthday has to match the date. And February 29th comes less frequently than once a year. Consequently, you know, Frederick is about to turn 21, but his 21st birthday is many years away. Do you accept this? Well, yes, <laughs> given the definition of... Uh, I, yep. Given the definition. I maintain that it is an argument from authority. <laughs> okay. It's that fallacy. <laughs> um, wine is an authority on logic. He's not an authority on birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it's been a very successful example of an argument from authority. <laughs> it's uh, one that's persisted for over 50 years. Um, but if you go to the, the uh, so let's imagine that Frederick has a, a twin sister, Frederick, and, and she's in a quandary about when, a dilemma, to, about when to celebrate her 21st birthday. Um, she thinks her brother's been hoodwinked by, by pirates and quine and other killjoys, and she goes to the Oxford English Dictionary. Mm -hmm. She looks up birthday. She finds out that birthday is an anniversary. Mm -hmm. Right. Nowhere oh. does it say to be celebrated on the exact date. It says it's an anniversary, right? Once a year. <laughs> <laughs> By definition. And then he, to be sure, she looks up anniversary <laughs> and it says exactly that. Uh, uh, you know, something to celebrate it on, uh, 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 on a yearly basis. It says mm -hmm. nothing about the exact date. 
um, you know, think of Easter. <laughs> right? So that is an anniversary, right? right, right Birthday is right. the same. They're an anniversary. It says nothing about the exact date. It does say the only exceptions it mentions are things like two week anniversary, mm -hmm. where it where it's specified. Um, the, the, there's nothing in the, as far as in those two entries at any rate to uh, to support Quine. In fact, quite the opposite. The implication, you know. Um, you know, conversational implicature, what have you. The implication is that that um, you know, uh, birthdays are anniversaries that are celebrated once a year, and mm -hmm. the Quine is wrong. Come back to Frederick's dilemma. Now, what does she do? Well, she can celebrate on a twenty first. There's no twenty ninth of February, so she can celebrate apparently on the twenty. 8th of February, the last date of February, or on the 1st of March being the date after the 28th of February. Mm. So there are, there are principles that seem to help one way or the other, but there's no principle that really determines which. There's a lack of a principle that determines which. So this is another example of a hyperdox. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it, it, uh, and, uh, you know, I just wanted to sneak that sort of introduction in. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. So, yeah. so, what you're uh -huh. saying here is that a paradox over determines the truth condition, so to speak, of whatever the proposition is involved. And a hyperdox under determines that because you don't have a principle that would give her in when is your birthday, if your birthday is on February 29th. So you can celebrate on February 28th or March 1 depends on you. Is that the thing going on here? Yes, that's right. So paradox will determine it in different ways. Mm. You can get cases where you've got more than one reason for the same result, but in case of paradox, you've got pretty good reasons for different results. Mm -hmm. So there, yeah. there's a kind of over-determination of cases in the paradoxes and yeah. under-determination of cases in hypodoxes. Yes, that's right. And you're saying that you could have for is it a general claim wherein for every paradox you have you could have a hypodox as a jewel? I'm working on a piece where I claim uh, for almost all antinomies, so it's a restricted conception of paradox. You you do have paradoxes that don't necessarily relate and uh, conclude with inconsistency. Mm -hmm. uh, despite what Quine might have suggested. Um, so here's an example of a liar-like paradox. A um, hundred percent, you know, so, uh, here's, here's a, a pseudo paradox. 80% of statistics lie. Mm -hmm. You can interpret that as 80% of statistics. Of <laughs> okay, okay, uh, okay. Now, um, you know, most people have these sort of inklings at times. Mm -hmm. um, but if if that's right, other things being equal, as they say, um, you know, no further information, relevant information, then there'd be an 80% chance that that statistic, the one that says 80% of statistics. It's also a lie. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, so it's, 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 it's a kind of a self unless you've got some other basis for it, it's kind of a self-undermining claim. <laughs> right? Now, if you take it to extremes, 100, and you claim, say someone does, and claims 100% of statistics are false, then that claim being itself a statistic has to be false. Mm -hmm. right? And um, when you think about it, if it has to be false, that means not 100% of statistics are false, which means that some statistic is true. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a sort of paradox that Church point, Alonzo Church pointed out in about 1943. Um, it's a strange inference. Right. Uh, it's strange that you can get this sort of existential claim from, you know, the the you know a self undermining claim. Mm -hmm. So, if all you knew is you know the the original claim, you know. Uh, how, how, how did you, it, it seems to be, deduction is, you know, non amplitude in the sense that it doesn't take you beyond what's contained in the premises. Um, but here seems, here it seems to be an example of a deduction which does. Mm -hmm. 
in a way. You 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 learn something that you didn't wasn't obviously you didn't obviously know on the premise. Right, right. Or the assumption in this case. Um, so, um, yeah, actually, you could extend this to the lottery paradox, to the preface paradox, and so on, because those. You can. Yeah, you can. So, say we say um, uh, something. I'm saying in this in in, in this blog mm. is overstated. <laughs> Um, now, um, if nothing else is overstated, I've just overstated, <laughs> made an overstatement. <laughs> um, you know, so if it wasn't, I, I'd have a, it, it seems as though it must be true. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, um, now, when you put these sort of things together, when you put something together which must be false and something together which must must be true, you know, cases like in cases like this, involving truth, mm. you seem to have a liar paradox. So, um, you know, the, the the usual examples are things like, you know, uh, the original Greek example was something like "I am lying." Mm. A man just says "I am lying." That's all he says. Uh, referring to what he's actually saying, and, and they took this to be about whether or not it was true, um, and, and there seemed to be quite a quite a debate about it, um, as there still is. <laughs> uh, so and, this is a and, classic uh, Cretan paradox, right? All Cretans are liars. Oh uh, well, that's even earlier. Epimenides the Cretan, around you know, okay. on or about six hundred BC. Mm -hmm. um, or BCE, if you prefer, um, uh, he, he, in, a, in an epic poem, he says, uh, Cretans always lie. And he's a uh, <laughs> And this, get, this gets uh, quoted, you know, as rather humorously by Polymachus, who's, uh, you know, one of the first, one of the librarians from Alexandria, before, uh, Alexandria before the library brought birth down. So he had access to that poem, you know, and he made reference to it. Um, mm -hmm. And then it even ends up in the Bible, you know, one of them a prophet of their own and says, you know, apparently St. Paul had been to a bad travel experience in Crete, you know, <laughs> the, the chariot taxi drivers ripped him off or something, you know, sort of, and he was very down on them. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he said, you know, one of them, even a prophet of their own says Cretans always lie, you know, and he goes on with a few other. Yeah, right. Um, and then he says, this statement is true. <laughs> Um, My so now, now we now now we have a paradox. You know, so at first, you know, so it was like you know, like Polymachus, you know, sort of making a bit of a joke of the fact that this can't be right. Um, but then he says it is right, and you know, if you think that, and, you know, with respect, if you think that um, you know uh, every statement in the Bible is true, then then you have a paradox. Um, but. Um, the usual examples here are to, you know, you have to do things like assume that every other Cretan statement is false mm -hmm. in order to get this into a paradox, or you do what Church did in 1943. You say, well, look, um, Cretans, Cretans always lie. That can't be right. So there must be some true Cretan arguments. How strange. Mm -hmm. And isn't it, isn't it amazing? You've got this, um, you know, uh, potential paradox, proto, this paradox, if you like, sitting there in ancient times um, around 600 BCE and then all the way through to 1943 and then <laughs> someone, someone draws out an extra variation, mm. you know, and, and a significant variation, you know, this, this variation of churches is quite significant. Prior picks up on it and talks about it at length. Um, but the ones we're dealing with mostly today are ones that involve contradictions. So, you know, sort of going back to Quine's idea of an antinomy being something that produces a contradiction. I don't know why I did that because it's not a technical term. <laughs> <laughs> produces. <laughs> and I, I, I guess it might be because you don't have to stop at the contradiction. Mm -hmm. So um, if we look at our example, um, a more formal example, you know, we've got um, 
as a premise in some way, shape or form. We've got something like the liar sentence is the liar sentence is not true. Now, some people like to stipulate this. Uh, you know, I generally prefer example. You can have examples that aren't uh, just a matter of stipulation. You know, like my favourite sentence is my favourite is my favourite sentence is not true. Uh, then it just happens to be empirically true. That's my favourite sentence. <laughs> I, I prefer those sort of examples, but it's more succinct. Fit on the screen if we do this. <laughs> you know, slightly. <laughs> Um, so, you know, the, there's a principle of truth, which we'll talk about a bit more shortly, um, you know, that if this liar sentence is true, um, or rather, this liar sentence is, in quotes, is true, if and, if and only if uh, the liar sentence is not true. So I should spell that out, sorry. Mm -hmm. The liar sentence is not true, is true, if and only if the liar sentence is not true. And, and then you can see what's going to happen very soon. Um, we just substitute what the liar sentence refers to, which was given in the first premise, for um, that quoted expression in the second uh, premise. And we end up with the liar sentence is true if and only if the liar sentence is not true. Now, most people think this is false, except for many logicians who work with three-valued logics in <laughs> true <Right. laughs> but but i personally uh I, I i think the natural interpretation is that it's false and but if you use classical logic uh there there's a a, a sequence of ways in which you can infer that uh, that any sentence you like so mm. what, what sentence do you like my favorite ice cream is vanilla. Right. So you can prove that. <laughs> <laughs> um, From the liar sentence. Prove that, that it's not the case as well. You know, sort of you can prove any sentence you like there, JJ, um, yeah. by use of this inference called, you know, called explosion. Mm -hmm. uh, its Latin name was ex contradictione quad libet or ex From a contradiction, anything follows. Yep, exactly. And, um, you know, it, so it gets talked about by medieval logicians quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and you know, nowadays uh, it's still talked about quite a lot. And, and so it should be because you, you think about what we were saying about deduction being non-amplitive. You mm -hmm. don't want to be able to infer anything in the conclusion that wasn't something you already really knew in the premises. So explosion really looks like a, a non-amplitative uh, inference. Mm -hmm. And hence, you know, you'd really have to question whether it really is a deductive inference, valid, deductive, you know, a good deductive inference. And the classical logicians will say, oh yeah, but contradictions never obtain. So you're never gonna get this conclusion. It's because the argument's not never sound, but still, you know, <laughs> I, th I think the dialetheists whom we'll come to, who are people who accept that there are some con true contradictions, not mm. too many, but, you know, well, some, they will find fault with explosion. Um, and, and you can see why they would want to do that. It just does look like, um, it doesn't look like a very good deductive entrance. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, so I've projected the, the liar argument. Yeah. Yes. So, how how do we solve it? So, if we want our logic to be preserved, right? So, how would we say that there's something wrong here in this argument? There, there are a number of ways of doing this, right? So, that principle of truth mm -hmm. um, has been a focus for a, a, a lot of. Um, the solutions that most people following Quine uh, and earlier than Quine are uh, based on work, particularly by Tarski, but even going back to Russell, mm -hmm. um, they would reject that principle. They would say it needs to be revised, avoided and replaced. <laughs> you know? and, and, and we might, we'll come to talk about what that principle is. I, I, I think at this point, it's probably worth uh, saying it's a principle about the truth. We, we tend to think that if something is the case, then it's true. 
mm. and that those two things go together. And we tend to think that if something's not the case, then, then it's false. It's not true. And those two things go together. Um, so we tend to think that, you know, um, if some sentence is true, then it is the case. Just, you know, some sentence is true just when it is the case, in fact. Uh -huh. And, and uh, on, on the next slide, um, we can see that the T schema there, that, that this is something that based on work of, this is from work of Tarski. Um, he didn't actually use the label until, you know, the label comes from his 1944 work, but I've just inserted it there in square brackets. Um, he, um, you know, says, well, look, you know, um, there are these biconditional sentences, the if and only if sentences, um, that seem to be sentences of a special kind could serve as partial definitions of truth. So if you had all of them collectively, you might have a definition of truth. Um, and he gives this general schema, the T schema. So, which is what I was saying, you know, if a sentence, a sentence X is true, if and only if it is the case, and here you replace X with the name of the sentence, usually and for our purposes today, we're talking in natural language mostly, you use a quote name. Um, then uh, you replace the P with that sentence and, and you get one of these uh, T by conditionals, these, an instance of the T schema, the truth schema, if you like. Um, and he says, if all of those were true, collectively you would have a definition of truth, but they can't all be true. Guess why? Because of the liar paradox. So if you just flip back one slide, um, you can see there that our, our um, our second premise um, was based on that principle of truth. Right, so um, what most logicians and mathematicians have done is reject that principle and revise this, it. Yeah, uh, this is also known as this transparent truth idea. Uh, yeah, so I, I, this, um, there are uh, other ways of representing this sort of principle. Mm -hmm. Um, so you might say that, uh, uh, and people do these days, they talk about transparent truth, where they're saying that for any given sentence, you can always substitute that sentence with uh, an expression saying that it's true. Right. Um, you know, uh, a name of the sentence followed by is true. Well, yeah. You'll be able to substitute that freely anywhere. Um, and vice versa, you can swap out. The, this, this claim claiming the sentence is true with the sentence itself. That's, um, as I understand it, transparency, um, which is obviously closely related to this T schema and instances of this T schema. Um, also, you can have rules of inference. So you can have a rule of inference for introducing truth. So from, given the sentence, then you can always infer that that sentence is true. Or well, given a claim that that sentence is true, you can infer the sentence. Um, th those are the three typical ways of cashing out these sort of principles of truth. You can, other things that some logicians have tried to do is weaken the principle. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you might, those rules of inference I talked to, you might put restrictions on them and, and go from there and see if you can get, avoid the liar paradox. Good luck. <laughs> you know, it's uh, so you know when you go back to Quine, what what Quine wants to do is um, following Tarski and Russell, he wants to um, stratify the truth predicate. So he wants to take out these principles and replace them with something else that that works on works on the basis of subscripting a truth predicate, so that you have multiple of them in a hierarchy that. Yeah where ones further up the hierarchy can refer back to the other the expressions containing the early, you know, the lower level truth predicates. But the lower level truth predicates can't refer to themselves and they can't refer to truth predicates further up the hierarchy, roughly speaking. Yeah. Um, you know, so he blames it basically, the liar paradox basically on expression, the truth predicate. Our what we might say naive, our natural language use of the truth predicate has to be replaced 
and regimented with a more formal use. And this is the way Tarski goes. Tarski basically says natural language is hopeless. I'm going off to do formal logic. Thank you very much. <laughs> and he does has an excellent career doing exactly that. Mm. Um, and he uses this stratification of languages. So each of these truth predicates, the truth predicate for the base level language is in the meta language. The meta language, the next level language. The truth predicate for the met meta language is in the next level language, the meta meta language. And you get what, what's called the hierarchy of languages, mm -hmm. and it's infinite. Um, and formally, they can work with this. Uh, but I don't think that's a terribly good idea in terms of, well, actually, I do think it's a very clever idea, and I do think it's a, in that respect, informally, it's a very good idea, but um, I'll, what, I, what it does is, is leave us in a quandary about what to do with natural language, oh. um, and, and I'll come back to that, which is, you know, the Pinocchio paradox is, a counter, is in a sense, a counterexample to that sort of solution. Um, but there's also a more uh, of, of a motivation for, for not wanting to use that solution because I want to use truth in natural language. I want to have a truth predicate in natural language without going into an infinite and having, infinite, having to formalize everything in an infinite hierarchy. And I think there are very good reasons for doing that that Hintika and Priest have brought out among others. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. There are other approaches. Um, so, you know, uh, Kripke says, well, you know, um, taking the whole, every instance of the truth predicate out of the language is a bit severe. You know, most of them are innocuous in the sense that they don't produce paradoxes. They're harmless. And they're they're non-paradoxical is what I should say. Um, <laughs> so for those that are germane to, to, to um, in the, the base level language, you can talk about them being true or, or not true. Um, and you allocate those sentences to, in your semantics to sets, uh, the extension of truth and the anti-extension of truth being those that are not true. And then you have those ones in the middle, like the liar sentence that fall into a gap um, and, and don't get a truth value in the base level language. But because they don't get a truth value in the base level language, in the meta language in Kripke's account, you can now say that they're not true in the meta language. Mm -hmm. um, so he's still got this hierarchy. Uh, it ends up, I haven't given you a full account of why, but you know, they, I've given you the start of that hierarchy. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, you, you can't quite avoid the hierarchy on the Kripke approach, even though you've got value, you know, truth value gaps. Mm -hmm. um, truth value gaps in, in a simple multiple multi-valued logic, they, they're associated with, um, uh, you know, a, a, a third value. Yeah, it's you know, neither in, true nor false. Neither true nor false, yep. yeah. Um, when we talk about it, we have to say it. <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, um, so they tend, those three valued logics are going to avoid um, what's called the law of excluded middle, mm -hmm. which, which says basically for, for every sentence, it's either the case or it's not the case. And because the liar sentence falls into this truth value gap, it, 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 you know, for those three valued logics, uh, the law of excluded mental doesn't appear to hold in the base in the base language. Um, so there's there's a logic that um, says we can have something like the T schema, uh -huh. um, and we can conclude with that third um, biconditional, which I you know, intuitively, although intuitively it leaves false in a three-valued logic, you can say it's true. Oh. And then you can block um, conclusion, concluding that, uh, uh, you know, so, sort of anything follow. Any, you, you can block the conclusion of the 
rely on paradox using a three valued logic with gaps. Right. Um, yeah, because the, the argument would not be valid now. Yeah. And so, um, but in contrast to that, you can, the dialetheists are going to say, well, we can have this similar sort of three valued logic, but we can consider our third value to be both true and false. And we'll say that the liar sentence is both because that's accepting the conclusion mm -hmm. that it is um, both true and false. And we can conclude um, that it's both true and false, but that argument to further argument to um, using okay. explosion doesn't follow. Because explosion is invalid in the dialectic logic. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, you have those other responses uh, to the liar. Um, and uh, now I just want to return to the point about why, why do we want to solve this in natural language? Mm -hmm. um, and someone like Hintinker says, well, Hintinker exactly says, uh, Tarski's theorem, which is his basically using a liar-like proof to show that you can't have, on, on his count, you can't have a truth predicate in natural language that for which all those instances of the T schema are true, in particular those for the liar. Tarski's theorem uh, is formulated so as to deal only with formal but interpreted languages satisfying certain conditions. Oh. But assuming the conditions of Tarski's results are satisfied by ordinary language, then we cannot define truth for this language. The main characteristic of our own natural language duly emphasized by Tarski is its universality. There is therefore no stronger meta language beyond or over it in which the notion of truth for this universal language could be defined. So what, what Hintiger is saying is we need natural language or natural language extended in certain ways as our ultimate meta language. That's mm. <laughs> in, for practical reasons that extensions of natural language are more or less formalized uh, you know, are the ultimate meta language in practice. Mm -hmm. um, and Priest says something, you know, to, to the same net effect. His argument is somewhat different, but um, yeah, yeah, it's. it's it... So, what what happens is Tarski, Tarski's analysis of the liar is there are two things required. You need this sort of principle of truth, and you need the usual laws of logic, like this law of excluded middle we talked about. Mm -hmm. um, and he says the problem comes from this, this, this principle of truth together with being able to name everything in natural language and, 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 um, and have all these instances of using the tree predicate, truth predicate like as with license. That he calls semantic closure. And he says um, natural language is semantically closed. Mm. That, that's the real problem because he wants to accept the ordinary laws of logic. Priest, being a dialetheist, um, wants to say, no, there's a problem with the ordinary, there's no problem with the semantic closure, there's a problem with the ordinary laws of logic. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, you can see when you look, as, you, as I said, when you look at what explosion does for you and compare that, what the idea of deductive logic is, you can see that <laughs> there's something to that. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and then there, there are these other other accounts where you know you, you using uh, truth value gaps all right you know which also make modifications to the law of excluded middle or other principles of logic and, and or other principles of logic okay yeah. so it seems like you, you need to let go either of the principle of truth like Tarski did or mm -hmm. let go of your basic principles of logic the standard logic, classical logic. So either turn gappy or turn glutty to, to use the, the terminologies. Yeah, when you, go, when you go down to the sentential logic, you've got a choice between glutty and gappy. No. Okay, uh, but your strategy in solving the liar paradox is different from these uh, current options. Yeah, so I, I think it's a problem with predicate logic. Okay, so- Not sentential logic. So how do you solve this? Your, your suggestion is to convert the liar paradox to a hypodox. That's so right. How, how does it work? 
Right. So, so um, you know, what I want, the, the, the aim is to, when you think about, this, you know, the, the, the sort of metaphor of explosion, the aim is to diffuse yeah. the, the, the liar paradox to a hyperdox, because compared to the liar, the truth teller, which says this, which is a sentence, self-referential sentence that says this self-referential sentence is true. Mm. Well, it might be true or it might be false and you could argue, you know, it could consistently be either, but there doesn't seem to be a principle that determines which it's a hyperdox mm -hmm. uh, interpreted that way. And um, compared to the liar, the truth teller is a squib. <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, which is, it gets a lot of attention, but nothing like all. <laughs> um, and and uh, so my idea is to diffuse uh, paradoxes like the lie to hyperdoxes like the truth teller. It won't be the same as the truth teller, mm -hmm. but, but it'll be one for which, you know, while it, you might be left with a residual issue about determining what its truth value is, uh, you won't have a proof of a contradiction. Mm -hmm. And to do this, yes, I've got to restrict some logic. But I argue for some minimal restrictions. If, if you remember, we used that what I, uh, on in the proof of the lie, what I called substitution of identicals. Mm -hmm. And um, in uh, first order logic with identity, you know, one of the one of the ways it can be referred to is this bracket, this identity elimination summary, you know, which is abbreviated by the equal sign with uh, the capital E. Mm -hmm. Um, first, there is a slight restriction on the truth teller that I, the T schema that I argue for, um, the way Tarski defines it, which I quoted there, um, allows you to use non-canonical names like we did uh, and substitute them freely. Mm -hmm. Um, so like we've got the liar sentence, that's a non-canonical name for the liar sentence. It is mm. not true. Um, so I do I do restrict uh, in the in stating the principle. I restrict the principle to using like quote names or canonical names like quote names. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I also restrict substitution of identicals or you know equals equals e in a in, in a more formal system. Um, and, and I spell this out in, in some recent papers in two, 2019 and 2020. So uh, for um, your solution, you're rejecting premise one and premise three here. And no, no, well, no, no. Okay. Um, or so, uh, uh, my, um, not premise one. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm saying premise one's fine. I'm saying premise two is as stated here is fine because it'll my uh, restriction on the T schema is not going to prevent premise two. You've got the canonical name for the sentence used here, mm. the, the quote name. That's fine. Uh, it's the inference from, you know, as you went on to say, yeah, three, I've got a problem with. <laughs> it's <false. laughs> and, and, and it's the inference uh, by substituting some identical. So I'm going to restrict that mm. so that you cannot, in these circumstances, substitute non-canonical names like the liar sentence freely mm -hmm. in, into expressions like two. Now you, you can do it when you've got a sentence standing on its own that, that says, you know, what David said, uh, sorry, when you, when, you, when you know that what David said was that, you know, um, honey, honey is manufactured in beehives. <laughs> Um, and you ha and someone else is saying, you know, and you've got a sentence that says, um, honey is manufactured in beehives is true. You can substitute and uh, according to my rules uh, into that in that context because you, those sentences aren't under an assumption and they aren't in a complex expression, mm. even though they they fall within the scope of the truth predicate. Right. So um, I'm allowing quite a lot of substitution of identicals and all the normal ones you should think I'm restricting it. And 
I have to motivate this, right? So what, I, what I've not emphasised in all these and what, you know, you didn't get when I talked about Sainsbury's heuristic is that for each of those options he refers to, you have to justify it. <laughs> <laughs> now, the thing that's really hard with most antinomies is most people would just like a counter example mm -hmm. to, to an inference if it's going to be fallacious or, or you know. Um, and, uh, you know, it's kind of, these things are kind of like, you know, division by zero. They're, they're kind of more in the case of where it's a systematic issue. <laughs> <laughs> and any counter sample you give is likely to involve division by zero. <laughs> you know, um, so um, you, I do give two separate lots of arguments for both these restrictions. Mm. One, one, one a lot of arguments in my 2019 and another lot in my 2020. Mm. Some of these arguments are ones that I've been sort of peddling since 1980s. Um, mm. never, I've, I've presented papers, but never managed to publish before. And I'm very glad to have the 2020 <laughs> article finally published. Um, so, um, Okay. But the arguments, are, are, you know, sort of are more than we're going to go into today. I'm just saying that I do, I, the onus is on me to justify it. I do believe I justify it in two different ways uh, in the 2019 article and in the 2020 article. Um, okay. So in 2010, you and your daughter, Veroni, published an article in analysis entitled The Pinocchio Paradox. Now, I'm not sure if you know, but your paradox became an internet meme. It's famous in the internet. If you search, there's a Wikipedia entry on this one. But you could, could you tell us something about this paradox and has anyone solved it yet? Yeah, um, I'm the proud dad over this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I started my thesis back in 2000 and I explained uh, what I was working on as best I could to mm -hmm. my children. And for some reason, I thought it was a reasonable, you know, question to ask them to come up with their own variations. We've, we've talked about variations like the, statistic, the one about statistics, uh, you know, mm -hmm. church's variation on the Epimenides, you know, uh, these things keep coming up. Um, and um, anyway, for some reason, I thought it was a reasonable question. <laughs> <laughs> I left him with it. My son came back with one where he says, you know, a policeman uh, asks a, a suspect whether he's lying and the suspect simply says yes. Mm. Um, and, and that one's like one in the literature from Jonathan Kahn. Um, anyway, Veronique came back with uh, Pinocchio says, my nose will grow or will be growing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we talked about it a bit and got, you know, about the tense of it because, you know, there's some ambiguity in the story about when exactly Pinocchio's nose grows relative to his things. Because, of course, Pinocchio is the hero of popular Italian children modeled by Collotti. Mm. And so he was a puppet that grew up into a little boy at the end of the novel when he learned to pull his own strings. It's a wonderful novel. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... Pinocchio's nose grows just uh, when, uh, when what Pinocchio is saying is untrue, mm -hmm. um, you know, which you know, Veronique picked up on, uh, and she's quite right. You know, so Pinocchio, uh, she says, my nose is growing. Uh, we, then if his nose is growing, well, then by the Pinocchio principle, what he said is untrue, and, and then by the principle of truth, which, you know, she, she didn't know about, but, you know, everybody intuitively uses, mm -hmm. um, it, what he says is tr true because his nose is growing. So it's both true and false. So, can, so if Pinocchio's nose is not growing, then, uh, then what he said by the Pinocchio principle um, is true. Mm -hmm. um, but by this principle of truth, it's not true. So it's both. <laughs> um, and, and so you've got this paradox, um, which is a version of, you know, a variation of the liar. And, and I, I sort of, I was very impressed. <laughs> and, and, 
proud of that. <laughs> and, and so in February 2001, I got her to draw it up for me, as you can see there. Uh -huh. um, and then I made a foil of it. Back in those ancient days, we used to use foils, or I did, uh -huh. um, you know, which you put on a, a display, a thing that shines light through and displays the foil up on the screen. Yeah, well, we the before yeah. I was going to give a talk, uh -huh. you know, just for keep people, you know, entertained a little bit before things started off for those who came on time or, or a little bit early um and uh so this it, is the picture yeah yeah so <laughs> i i had her draw that and then i put it on a foil and i used to use it at the start of my talks and so you know for example it, in, in the 2004 australasian association of philosophy and 2005 australasian association of philosophy mm. um talks that i gave um, I, I had this up there, you know, at the start for people who were turning up, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, give them something to keep them amused before I started talking. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, it, this, this, uh, this is off uh, the front page of my thesis, which was published online in 2008. Oh. Um, and, and, you know, people quite, you know, kindly took an interest in this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of, I, I appreciate it when people, you know, uh, you know, refer to Veronique because she did devise it. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, I'm sort of happy that it's had all, <laughs> all this attention on, on the, um, uh, on the internet. That, that image is uh, Veronique's and we've permission to use it today. Mm. Um, so it, it's, um, it, you know, I mean, I'm very, very proud dad. <laughs> um, but the significance of the, the Pinocchio paradox as a variation, you know, like we said with um, Church's variation, you have an example of a, a, a paradox that doesn't result in directly in a, that seems paradoxical before it ever gets to a, a contradiction. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a, um, in the Pinocchio paradox, we have an example of a liar paradox using an empirical predicate or mm. not a semantical predicate, not a synonym. So when people, when the original example, I am lying, it was used as a synonym or at least to entail that, you know, something that involved the concept, a semantic predicate, you know, about lying or not telling the truth, mm -hmm. um, not an empirical predicate. Whereas uh, my nose is growing, uh, Pinocchio's nose is growing, <laughs> as this empirical predicate is growing. Uh, and it's in no way a synonym for truth. Um, you've got to add this Pinocchio principle, which makes it, you know, sort of somewhat, um, as people point out, somewhat fanciful. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, nevertheless, you know, sort of doesn't make it self-contradictory. So the difference between the Pinocchio and the and the the Barber paradox, I've argued, is is that the Barber scenario on its own is self-contradictory, and there's you know, so consequently, it's there just is no. Uh, it follows as a matter of you know um, pure logic that there is no such barber. Cannot be. Uh, it doesn't follow as a matter of pure logic, or doesn't seem to that there is no such Pinocchio, and cannot be. Mm -hmm. um, it's not obvious how you prove that, um, except by using the Pinocchio paradox. But then you've got to involve truth, uh -huh. um, and 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 it looks very much like a, a, a variation of the liar that uses an empirical predicate, which is a counterexample to um, Tarski's idea that analysis that uh, the problem came from the, the notion of truth. these semantic predicates being in um, the same level of language, right, um, and it. And, and in fact, in, in an article in 2018, I try and prove that, you know, sort of, if you're with those, uh, if you use the Pinocchio paradox, you can give a counterexample to, you can actually prove the counterexample. This is a counterexample to Tarski's uh, account of the liar. You can uh, prove a version of the liar. Um, Granted that, I mean, Tarski wouldn't allow you to form the sentence in a formal language, but we're talking about natural language here. Even if natural language is stratified according to the rules that he he stipulated, because it's an empirical predicate and the very sort of predicate you want in the base language, that Pinocchio can utter his statements in the base language. Then you can have truth for the base language in the meta language, mm -hmm. 
and you can give a stratified version of the T-schema as per ta Tarski's account and you can prove a contradiction. So I claim. <laughs> and I set it all out in 2018, so, so it's in there. Um, but has anyone solved it yet? Uh, look, there have been some very good attempts. Uh, there are there are lots of things out there on the internet that that are reminiscent of other approaches to the liar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's there's a lot of debate about you know, um, you know, given the form, you know, given if the Pinocchio principle is about lying, then then what's lying really about? You know, about yeah. just truth and can can we get around that? Mm -hmm. And and that proves to be quite interesting. Um, but you know, I'm mostly interested in the the, the version of that that uh, deals with truth because I want to have truth in the metal in the ob, in the base in, You know, I want to be able to use truth in natural language in a way that natural language can be the meta language for whatever. You know, whether when I'm comparing systems of logic and talking about these paradoxes and so on, mm -hmm. um, and I don't think I don't think it's. Uh, I, I, I haven't seen a complete solution, no, but I've seen some very interesting work. Mm -hmm. I, no, you know, I, I find it interesting to, to, to look at some of these, these comments. <laughs> I do. Um, so I would try and solve it the same way I've solved the lie. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Pinocchio is going to have an identity crisis. <laughs> Pinocchio has had a number of logical adventures uh -huh. right? and so uh, you know my original um, write-up with Veronique in 2010 was to use it uh, as I said to a counter example as a counter example to to Tarski's approach but I but I also tried to you know write short articles where Pinocchio goes on a number of advent logical adventures such as Pinocchio against the dialetheists you know where yep. you've got this image of Pinocchio brave little Pinocchio <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and um, and he has some success, I think, but the dialetheists think otherwise. And J.C. Beale was kind enough to take this take this on and re and, and give a response. And we had a bit of a debate in uh, in the analysis journal. Mm. Um, and uh, 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 Frank D'Agostini and uh, Elena Fikarov have also responded. Uh, on behalf of the dialetheists, and uh, I find find this quite challenging, actually. So I've got to get, <laughs> really, really, got, really got to in, get in there and defend my daughters. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, and respond to this. Um, I think I think you know part of the response has been how implausible this has been, and when we go some of those definitions of paradox I mentioned refer to plausibility mm -hmm. um and so they've challenged i feel challenged on this um but i you know i mean think about the grandfather paradox how plausible is it that tim was going to be able to time travel anyway i mean that never was never an objection to the time travel paradox. <laughs> <laughs> and, and 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 you know I, this is a bit of an ad hominem but you know it's sort of i find it ironic but <laughs> The dialetheists who accept true contradictions <laughs> as plausible. Okay, back, back me about the plausibility of <laughs> no, okay. but they do, and yeah. they do it very well. <laughs> so uh, you know, so so I'm pleased to have that debate. Uh, you know, so I'm pleased they've got other things to pay attention to, and I'm pleased that they've paid attention to this, and you know, we can have that debate. Loriano Luna has also used the paradox in some of his work to argue against. Uh, physicalism for truth, and uh, and I think he does a good job. Um, there are some some other comments out there that I need to I need to take account of uh, in various articles. So you know, um, you, you know how it is. The daughter <laughs> word is far more important than <laughs> you know far more <laughs> gets far, okay. far more notorious than your own. <laughs> so so uh, it's a it's a pleasing uh, conundrum. And, okay, uh, so yeah, on a more personal note, so what's yeah. your advice for those who want to get into professional philosophy? Um, look, um, 
you know, given my experience and, and you know, my midlife career change sort of thing, um, I, I would encourage people if you have an opportunity to work, out, work do some work outside of academia mm -hmm. to take it and then come back. I, I think it broadens your life experience. Um, other than that, I, I think there are people better qualified to, to advise you. <laughs> but, um, you know, based on my own experience, that's 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 my advice. I, I think getting getting broad experience in, in life, being you know, if you're going to do philosophy, you want to philosophize about things that you've got not only knowledge of but experience with. Okay. Um, but would you say that your career in philosophy is worth it? Yeah. Look, um, here I am. I'm lucky enough to and enjoying being, uh, you know, a, a, an honorary visitor at ANU. Mm. Uh, I've, I've got things that interest me that I'm pursuing uh, with the support of, of philosophy at ANU. Um, what can you ask? What more can you ask for? I, you know, it, it's, it's so, so in that sense, I, I think it's worth it. But if you mean in terms of money, well, <laughs> <laughs> that's another question. <laughs> so, you know, here we, here, we, here we make a distinction. You know, it's not just about paradoxes. We want to make distinctions. But, you know, in terms of life projects, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I think you can find interests and pursue them with philosophy that, that are, you know, meaningful. Okay, so thanks again, Peter, for sharing your time with us. For you guys, join me again for another episode of Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Thank thanks. you very much, JJ. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>